Hey everybody, this is Neil Pasrich and welcome, or welcome back, to another chapter of three books. Man, I never get sick of that opening music. I'm so glad we extended it back to like a 45 minute crescendo. We got that music composed just for the show and it is just like an upbeat, kind of complex, layered reflection of what I think three books is, right? This is an ultimate countdown. We are counting down the 1,000 most formative books in the world. We are sitting down with 333 of the world's most inspiring people, live and commercial-free and sponsor-free and interruption-free, wherever they want to sit down. Like we are flying all the way down for chapter six, down to Key West, Florida, where we sat down with Judy Bloom and sat in her books and books bookstore with the cashier beeping in the background and customers walking by, she gave us a tour and told us about the three books that shaped her life. We went all the way up to the University of Ottawa, English department for chapter 13, where we sat down with booktuber, Ariel Bissett. She's finishing her master's in English up there, and she has taken over the internet, recommending and talking about books. She's got hundreds of thousands of followers, and we talked to her about how that all came about and which three books most shaped her life. And we went all the way back down to Detroit, Michigan, where we zoomed to the top of the Fisher Building, Art Deco Building in downtown Detroit, where just before he went live on the air on the Mitch Album Show, we sat down with Mitch Album, author of Tuesdays with Maury, the number one selling memoir of all time. And we got his three books. These three books plus three books plus three books are going to eventually add up to 1,000 books. When? Well, it's going to all happen. It's all going to all culminate on September 1st, 2031. Yeah, I started this project in my 30s. I'm going to be in my 50s by the time we are done. But on the exact minute of every single new moon and every single full moon, because you can't trust the Gregorian calendar, you can only trust that lunar calendar. It's 30,000 years older, people. We're going to drop a chapter, just like we're dropping this one. And for this chapter of three books, we're going to go to the Simon & Schuster Publishing Offices in downtown Toronto, where we were able to catch up with James Fry on his North American book tour for his newest book, Katerina, which I really enjoyed. Who is James Fry? Well, you got to be living under a rock if you haven't heard of this guy. He wrote a million little pieces. And, and, And like, does your perception of him kind of start where mine did? You know, when I was merging bookshelves with Leslie, we were moving in together. I was like, hey, Leslie, you want to you like kind of put our books all together on one shelf, right? Obviously. And she's like, what are you talking about? No, I don't want to merge bookshelves with you. I don't want to merge brains with you. I don't want to merge minds with you. I want to have my own independent kind of development as a person. I want to look at the books that shaped me and changed me and altered me. And and, and these are these books, not not your Farsight galleries and uh, your Calvin and Hobbes and all my all my books. And I was like, yeah, that's interesting. So we started comparing the books on both of our shelves. We had some overlaps. We both own like Influence by Robert Cialdini, for example. And then I noticed she had this book, A Million Little Pieces by James Fry, F-R-E-Y, but pronounced Fry. And I was like, oh, there's that book. She's like, yeah. I'm like, isn't that that book that like Oprah like lambasted? You know, is it real? Is it not? Is it a memoir? Is it fiction? You know, she picked it for her book club and then she brought the guy back on the show and like trashed him and super controversial. And I mean, why do you have that book? And she's like, well, why don't you have this book? Have you read it? And I was like, no, I don't even know what it's about. A million little pieces of what? You know, and she's like, oh my gosh, Neil, you got to read it. It is the most gripping story I've ever read about addiction and growth and finding yourself. And I was like, Really? She's like, yeah. So, so I grabbed the book off her bookshelf, even though she doesn't want to merge bookshelf. She's okay with the borrowing and lending. And by the way, I, I should say in retrospect, she was right. I'm so glad we didn't merge bookshelves now that I look back on it. Um, more on that another time. But I started reading this book, A Million Little Pieces, and, and I could not go to sleep. I mean, it was I, I was holding my breath while reading it. Like I kept having these huge deep breaths, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm sucked into this thing. James Fry breaks every single literary convention you can imagine, or this sentence structure with this pulsing staccato like writing. And I was, I, I, I lost myself. I lost where I was and what I was doing, what time it was. And I got completely enthralled by this book. 
a million little pieces. So of course, I fall back into James Fry's other writing. I'm like, Bright Shiny Morning, an incredible novel about Los Angeles. And it really is about Los Angeles. It's not, there's characters and there's people and there's places, but really the book is about a place. It was fantastic. And like I mentioned, his new book, Katerina, which is really kind of like a prequel to A Million Little Pieces, a mostly true account, of course it is, labeled fiction, a mostly true account of, of Jay or James uh, walking the streets of Paris in his early 20s after college wanting to write the next big American novel which you could argue that maybe he did. And so I was super, uh, I felt super lucky to sit down with James uh, down in Toronto at the Simon & Schuster head offices. And we get into a ton of interesting places and themes in this book. I will say up front that James Fry isn't probably the guy that you think he is. Um, As he says in the show, you know, people think he's going to be this kind of nasty, snarling, kind of kind of like angry guy, but but he comes across as incredibly centered and down to earth and grounded and happily married and a father of children that he's trying to raise in a really thoughtful and intentional way. We talk about how do you get your kids to read. We talk about secular Bibles. We talk about simplicity and patience and compassion. We talk about how do you learn how to avoid critics? How do you escape yourself? What true pain really is? I mean, he gets into the conversation saying, yeah, I got yelled at by a TV talk show host for an hour, but that's not real pain. Let me tell you what is. How we talk about what getting drunk really means. And we talk about how you open your door, step outside, and fall in love with whatever you see. I can't wait to share with you this chapter of three books. So let's go. Hi, James. Hi. Hi. I'm just uh, checking to make sure we're recording. We are officially recording. And here we are sitting in, in the Simon & Schuster offices in downtown Toronto, in the midst of your book tour for Katerina. Yep. Um, how, how's it going? It's been fun. I did like a warm up event in Connecticut, um, and then I did New York City, and I was in Toronto last night, and I'm here again tonight. I dig it here. Um, yeah, it's been fun. Thank you so much, James, for coming on Three Books. I uh, I know you're in in the midst of a busy tour, and I, I'm I'm really excited to talk to you because because um, I love reading your books. Thank you. I fall into them. They are emotionally gripping. I stay up late reading them, and uh, they they so suck me in. And so I, before I got here, I kind of looked up some some quotes you'd written about books. Thought cool. it might provide a little kind of scenescape for us. Curious what I said. And and some of them are from uh, your books themselves, or a character may have said them. You know, so that's why I'm just going to quote them to you, and they may not uh, all kind of come from you directly. But here's one: I skipped the introduction. If a book goes in the trash, I want it to go because of my thoughts on it. Not because of some asshole's thoughts who wrote the introduction. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably said that. Yeah, that was about the the, the Tao Te Ching, which we're going to get to in a minute. Um, it doesn't really matter what a book or a story is as long as it moves you, informs you, challenges you, entertains you, or changes you. Yeah, I believe that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I love that you have this um, kind of, you clutch this on this emotional resonance of books, which so many books don't have. Um, okay, here we go. A couple more. Um, I will not allow people to impose rules on me that don't make sense to me. And I live and work very much outside the literary world and the literary system. What they think and what they believe and what their rules are mean nothing to me. Um, A hundred percent true. I was discussing that with somebody yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, I got blasted in the Washington Post, just absolutely blasted. And my agent, who I always feel kind of silly talking about my agent, but he's also my best friend. Not my best friend, but one of my best friends and and the greatest reader I know. Um, I was driving into New York to do an event and he called me and he was like, hey man, have you seen the Washington Post? I said, yeah, I saw it. And he goes, I guess you forgot to apply for your membership in the Polite Literary Society again. (laughs) And I I said, yeah, I forgot. He goes, and you have forgotten again to kiss all the asses you're supposed to kiss to get the good reviews didn't you? And I was like, yeah, man, I forgot. Um, and we sort of laughed and, and I do exist outside of it. I didn't go to a fancy school. I don't go to literary festivals. I don't 
play that game. Um, and I don't write books that sort of fit easily into the, the sort of current canon mm. or even slipstream, yeah. relatively recent canon of, you know, polite American literature. And I don't want to. I don't want to write polite books. I don't want to write books that um, that are lauded by those people. I don't give a fuck. Um, I want to write books that it, that they hate, that defy everything they that they're doing. Yeah. That that sit outside of the system and either survive or not on their own. Why? I think a lot of the writers I love did that. You know, I loved books that were that were controversial. That that were divisive that were polarizing that were created by people who existed outside of polite literary society mm -hmm. um i think it's more interesting to work outside of it it's easy to do what everybody else does it's easy to do what everybody else expects you to do it's easy to follow rules um it's a lot harder and a lot more fun to say fuck all of that mm -hmm. to to find your own way yeah to, to to do what you feel inside, to do what, what you think is right, to do what's true to your, to your soul. Um, when a lot of our audience is, is writers and readers and booksellers, and, and um, sometimes I find the rules, when they exist for so long, uh, are kind of become invisible. Are there some some rules that you can see in, in the publishing world? I mean, Seth Godin in chapter three of this show called The Publishing World, uh, books by and for, books by ladies and gentlemen, written for ladies and gentlemen, published by ladies and gentlemen, for ladies and gentlemen to read. He had this funny quote, and he had this really very similar to you, kind of this idea that like, you know what, it's not about that. And um, I know his books are in different. For me, but, writing yeah. a book is about, you know, I, I, I've talked about books how books changed have changed my life over and over again. Um, I love reading books. I'm a consumer of books. I'm a, a fan of books. I read every day. I have for as long as I can remember. Um, and when I think about the books that mean the most to me, they're books um, I describe in Katerina about how when I read Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, I was mm -hmm. 21 years old. And it felt like somebody turned a light bulb on inside my soul, mm -hmm. right? There was darkness before and there was light after. I felt different. I thought different. I wanted to live differently. I was deeply moved. Um, and that's what I want to do. And I want to do that to readers. I want them to read my books and not be the same. I want, I want them to read my books and, and not believe that they actually exist. Those are the best books to me. Things I read and I'm, I can't believe that this exists and it's really magnificent that it does. Um, and I don't care about following rules to have to do that. Maybe, yeah. it, maybe, maybe my disdain for that is, part of it is the writers I like, but also like I grew up in the 80s. I was a punk rock kid. Mm -hmm. like we, we, we lived for defiance, <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, we 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 lived to stick it to the man, to to think that we somehow were these punks um, who didn't have to do anything but whatever we wanted to do. Yeah. And and I still think that way. My I have a thirteen year old daughter now, and she laughs and um, calls me an old punk. I'm like, you don't even know what a punk is. She's like, yeah, yeah. you're you're one. And in a way, yeah, I'm just an old grown-up punk. <laughs> That's a great segue, James, to transition because you mentioned you mentioned Tropic of Cancer. It is one of your three most formative books. Would you be okay if I just gave a thirty-second overview of it for listeners that don't know it? Yeah, and then lead into uh, us keep keep this conversation going about about defiance and about being a punk and about being in some cases obscene because this book was banned for obscenity. So we'll get into this. So this book is James's first book. It's Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller. Henry Miller lived from 1891 to 1980. The book was published by Obelisk Press uh, in 1934 in Paris. According to the back, this is now hailed as an American classic. Tropic of Cancer is Henry Miller's masterpiece. It was banned as obscene in the United States for 27 years after its publication in Paris in 1934. Only a historic court ruling that changed American censorship standards, ushering in a new era of freedom and frankness in literature, permitted the publication of this first volume of Miller's famed mixture of memoir and fiction with chronicles 
which, which chronicles with unapologetic gusto the body adventures of a young expatriate writer, his friends, and the characters they meet in Paris in the 1930s. Um, you say, as you, as you just mentioned, in, on page 34 of Katerina, your new book, you say you picked up this book, uh, or the character Jay picked up this book, and it was simple and direct, no pretension, no bullshit, where most writers tried to impress with their brains, with their skill, with their virtuosity. Henry Miller did not. It felt like he was talking, talking to me, sitting inside me, telling me things I had always wanted to hear, but had never heard. So tell us about your relationship with Tropic of Cancer. So I read Tropic of Cancer when I was 21. I was in college. I found a copy of it um, in the house where I lived. I don't remember exactly where. Maybe it was sitting on a couch or a table, but there was this book just sitting there. And I picked it up, and uh, I read the back, and, and it was all about how the book had been banned for all in every English-speaking country in the world for a long time. And I was like, well, fuck, that must be cool. <laughs> um, Great way to attract attention. Exactly. And I sat down, and I started reading it. And, and I still say the first page and a half of Tropic of Cancer is my favorite page and a half of anything oh, wow. I've ever read. Wow. I'm living at Villa Borghese. Um, That's the first and, line you just quoted. Yeah. yeah. And, and I kept reading it, and I, I, it's, you know, it's, it's this really it's, – it's a book written – by somebody who clearly has freed himself from polite society. Um, it's about sex. It's about love. It's about rage. It's about beauty. It's about art. It's about books. It's a, it's, it's an enlightened piece of work. Yeah. Really about a guy just wandering around Paris uh, who has no money. Um, there's a line on the first page. I have no money, no job, no resources. I am the happiest man alive. I, that's the exact line I underlined. Um, I have no money, no resources, no hopes. I am the happiest man alive. A year ago, six months ago, I thought that I was an artist. I no longer think about it. I am. Yeah, it's magnificent. It's a statement of intention. It's middle fingers up. It's I am who I am. I don't give a fuck what you have to say about it. Um, I make what I make. I don't give a fuck what you think about it. Um, you know, I, there's this book these days, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. That's, right. That's very popular. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, fucking Henry Miller did that almost a hundred years ago. Um, that could be the title of Tropic of Cancer. And, and it, it's written in a very simple, direct way. It's basically like a guy shit talking for a couple hundred pages, um, talking about his friends, talking about women he loves, talking about food he can't afford to buy, talking about books that he reads. And it's just magnificent. Um, I, I, I read it probably in a day or two. And I, I just, every, every moment of reading it that first time, I couldn't believe it existed, that somebody lived this way, thought this way, wrote yeah. this way. It's so long ago too, right? Like it's not a contempt. I mean, it's... It's from 1934. Yeah. Um, I had always been a big reader, but I always thought of writers as these sort of people who lived in the clouds. They were smarter than me or better educated than me or from... Um, had, had gone to better schools than me or, or had some magic inside them that I didn't have. Right. I'd, I'd never read a book and said, I could do that. I could do that. And, and I read Tropic of, Tropic of Cancer. I was like, yeah, I could fucking do that. Um, it, and, it, and it absolutely changed me. Six months later, I moved to Paris. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have a job. I didn't speak French. I just went... I went to chase the dream of trying to write a book that made somebody else feel the way Tropic of Cancer made me feel. That, uh, yeah. you know, I, I mentioned before that light bulb. I wanted, I wanted to, and I still, it's still the goal with every book I write, turn a light bulb on in somebody's soul so that um, when they're done with what I write, they're not the same, that, that it will always, that it will become part of them. It'll become part of their how they think and how they feel and how they live and how they deal with the world. Um, I'm a writer because of Tropic of Cancer, wow. for sure. Wow. You know, I um, chat with David Sedaris on this show, and he said the book that did that exact thing for him, like literally, uh, you know, it made me want to be a writer. I was like, I could do this. I didn't think I could, was a book called uh, Will You Please Be Quiet, Please? 
by uh, Raymond Carver. And then he, he followed up by telling me, he said, turns out I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> But the book made me think I could, right? Because it's these totally sh- short, quick sentences that are. So, did this book make you think you could be a writer, or did it make you realize you already were, or what was that? Do you know I what I'm definitely saying? Like, was not. I didn't. Yeah. I, I had. No, I had no formal education in writing. I hadn't ever been a particularly good student. Um, you know, I was a solid C minus student. Um, but C it was, for consistency, clearly. Yeah, C for consistency. <laughs> Consistently mediocre. Um, you know, the book was filled with profanity. It sounded like what? Uh, it sounded like the internal monologue I I had going on in my brain. Um, and it wasn't fancy. It wasn't. Clearly, he was. He, he talks in the book how he's not particularly well educated. Right. He just got lit up by other books the same way that book lit me up. Um, yeah, it just made me believe I could do it. I, I I literally thought if he can do that, I could do that too. Yeah. I just have to find my own way to do it. And there's a stunning, you know, the, the thing is about A Million Little Pieces, when, when, my, when my wife Leslie um, asked me to read it off of her shelf, we didn't ever merge bookshelves. Now we have two copies in our house. Uh, and I was like, oh my gosh, no, no, no um, sentence structure, no quotation marks. No, like it makes it feel so accessible. You mentioned sex. Um a minute or two ago, and and this book is famous for having a lot of graphic graphic sex scenes, as does your new book, uh, Katerina. And on chapter six of this this podcast, three books, I sat down with Judy Bloom, and she said one of her biggest problems with books today is that there's not enough sex scenes in them. She says we're not teaching children um, about sex through literature anymore. We're teaching it to them through, I don't want to put words in Judy's mouth, but we talked about pornography. Right. Right? And um, you're a father. You've got young kids. Um, how do you think about um, them learning about sex in the world today? Um, I, I'm, I'm a dad, too. So I'm thinking my kids are, are much younger. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to get, I mean, get what you We you live in an, uh, I, I don't know how Canada is compared to America, um, but- in this sense, but I know in America, we live in an incredibly repressive sexual environment. Mm-hmm. You can't talk about sex. You can't write about sex. Um, people are offended by sex. Oddly, on both the right and the left, they're offended by it. Um, yeah, kids find it through, you know, Pornhub and, and other places, finding porn on the internet. Um it's it's not really dealt with on television in any real way. If it is, it's you know protested and mm-hmm. boycotted. What? Uh, so how do you think about that with both as a dad, but also just in terms of literature, like what books your kids read or how how you yourself? Um, I mean, our our, yeah. old, our our I have a thirteen year old, an eleven year old, and an eight year old. Certainly, I don't think my eight year old's engaging in books that have any real sexual content in them. I imagine my eleven year old who's a boy, probably when him and his knucklehead friends are alone in their sleepover, Google various things. Um, Part of me wants to know, part of me doesn't. I know as a kid, like one of the great sort of adventures of being a kid was you go over to your buddy's house and you sneak around the house trying to find his dad's Playboys. Yeah. Playbook copies of Playboy and Penthouse. Maybe if it was a really sort of, um, I don't know what the word would be. Um, really dirty dad you might find a hustler or a we um (laughs) kids don't do that anymore right like i don't know anybody who has bought a copy of playboy or penthouse in forever Um, playboy even took out notably took out nudity yeah like why the fuck do you look at a playboy um if if it's for the articles yeah for the articles um playboy used to actually have great articles and great literature Right. right john lennon's last interview John Lennon, I mean, Norman Mailer and Philip Roth and Updike used to all write for Playboy. It was, it was like Esquire, but with dirty pictures. And you, this book is famous because it was censored and, and, and banned for so long. Do you um, uh, do anything like that in your own home when it comes to books your kids read? Or do you let them just go free in, in the bookstore or the library? Or do they like to read? Yeah. They, yeah. They, our, old, our oldest child loves to read. She's a real voracious reader. The other two, we sort of have to force them to do it. Um, my wife institutes a minimum of 30 minutes of reading time every day. Oh, interesting. Um, that's interesting. We have a reading couch. Oh, cool. Where you go to do your reading every day. Really? Yeah. 
Can more and multiple people can sit on the couch, obviously. Yeah, it fits up to three. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm picturing a fourth child crying in the corner. I just think books make you smarter. You know, books, um, book, book, reading books is like traveling. It it opens your mind to worlds you would never know existed. Um, my wife and I talk about how important we think traveling is. Yeah, you know, we live in Connecticut. We live in sort of a very bucolic, safe, privileged environment. Um, And we think our children need to understand that there's a big world out there and not everybody is like them. Um, So a couple times a year, we go on trips to places. Uh, My wife always says, I don't need to spend money on anything but trips. Mm. Um, You know, so the kids have been to Europe. They've been to India. um, They've been all over America. They've been to Latin America. Um, because we want them to see the world and know that, that it's not all America, certainly, and it's not all Connecticut. Um, and books are the same way. It, it, it opens your mind to possibilities, to different ways of thinking, to different ways of living, to different ways of feeling. Yeah. Um, I think it, it, for us, books are an incredibly important part of a, a, a childhood in a way, it's education, but in a way, it's not education. It's just teaching your kid about life. Yeah, yeah. I um, and I, that's what books did for me. Like they yeah. opened the new worlds to me. Like Tropic of Cancer is an easy example. Like as a twenty-one-year-old, I was living in Ohio. I would have never thought about running off to Paris. I didn't even know what Paris was. I knew Paris like had the Louvre, the Mona Lisa was there, and that the French were kind of fancy and supposedly made good food. That was my <laughs> the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, and the Eiffel Tower, of course. <laughs> that was my 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 idea of Paris. And then I read Tropic of Cancer and I was like, fuck. That place exists like that. Right? I have to see it. This is the single biggest reason why you moved to Paris. It is the reason why I moved. Entirely. Yeah. I moved to Paris to become a famous writer. I read Tropic of Cancer. I was like, I could do what that motherfucker did. Um, and I'm gonna go to Paris to do it. And then I started reading a lot of the books Henry Miller references. I started reading Celine, Rimbaud, Baudelaire. Um, I started reading Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Um, I just started reading, reading books um, and, and ran off to Paris. A lot of people used to run off to Paris because they loved Hemingway or Fitzgerald or the Lost Generation writers. And, and I've read those dudes, but... Um, I didn't want to be Hemingway sitting in De Mago. I, I wanted to be Henry Miller walking down Rue Saint Denis. Right? Yeah, there's some amazing quotes from from Henry Miller. I'm, I'm, I just want to throw a couple at you from from this book and see if you have a reflection or a comment on it. Um, the most popular quote from the book from Goodreads, so this has more votes than any other quote from this book, is about walking. The quote is, "I need to be alone. I need to ponder my shame and my despair and seclusion." I need the sunshine and the paving stones of the street without companions, without conversation, face to face with myself, with only the music of my heart for company. Yeah, that's a beautiful quote. I mean, it certainly resonates to me, not just in my time in Paris, but just in life, right? I, I often talk about people that will ask what it's like to go on a book tour, right? Or to do things like this. And I say, as a writer, I'm extraordinarily solitary person by nature. I'm happiest alone. I'm happiest in my own mind, in my own heart, alone. And, and, you know, walking is a, for me, and I think a lot of people, almost a form of meditation. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go to a city and I have free time, I just wander around. I don't, I don't ever know where I'm going. I don't have any agenda. I just walk around and I look at things and I feel things and um, I explore things. You know, you can learn almost more about a city by walking to a park and sitting there and watching the people in the park than you can from reading about it. Totally. Or, or watching a YouTube video about I'm, it. I'm the same with you. I'll, I'll go on, like, you know, if, if my wife and my kids are going to bed at, like, say, 7 and 8 p.m., so I'll be like, do you mind if I go out for, like, a six-hour walk right, right now? And I'll just walk around the whole city. And, 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 you know, I did this for years, and then I stumbled upon two essays almost at the same time. One was 
by Thoreau, so an inspiration of, of Henry Miller, who wrote an essay called Walking um, in, in his Civil Disobedience book. And then the other one's more contemporary from Nassim Taleb, the guy that wrote The Black Swan. And at the end, he wrote this essay called Why I Do All This Walking. And he talks about how exposing yourself to you know, the stimulation and the change in different coffee shops and different places actually provokes all kinds of kind of growth in your, in your mind and how you think. And I was like, there's my justification. <laughs> There's just my justification for kind of going on these random like five hour long walks. But it's the hell, I find it to be the most stimulating thing. I, I usually have cue cards in one pocket and a pen in the other. Do you have a, a, a walking equipment or a little just bat belt a you take? Just a pocket full of Nicorette, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Nicorette and a couple dollars. How, what do you, so you don't, you don't have the same issue I have, which is like when I have a thought, I'm like, I'm like instinctively want to capture it before I lose it. No, I always say if a thought is good enough or, or worthy enough, it'll come back to me. And if it isn't, it isn't. What a beautiful, confident way, way to think about it than my anxious jot it down approach of standing in the middle of the street with pe- cue cards I, and pens. I used to do that when I was in Paris. In Katerina, I talk a lot about walking. I, I, I walked everywhere. Um, I think that's maybe the greatest walking city in the world. Um, and, and I just wandered around day after day after day. And I used to carry little notebooks, these little brown Japanese paper notebooks with me. And I would, I would scribble things down and write things. And I, I, I would go sit in the Musée Rodin in front of the gates yeah. of hell, or I would go yeah. to museums and sit in front of paintings or, and, and I would write these things down. And I remember I thought they were, that I was just writing the most profound shit. Just like, I can't believe you just wrote that sentence. And, and a few years later I pulled them out and I looked at them. And I was like, God, this is all just bullshit. This is all just nonsense. Um, and I still had what I thought were the most important memories of Paris in my mind until I stopped using those things. Um, if something makes me feel uh, deeply enough, I'll remember it. It'll imprint itself on me and I'll, I won't forget it. And, and, and I think for me also part of the walking is, is not trying to remember it or control it or, or document it. It's just doing it for the sake of doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it's letting yourself have that freedom to, to not care if you forget something to just, it sounds, it's corny to live in the moment, yeah. to feel the moment, to just be alive and breathe and yeah. Well, it's true because sometimes when I do jot a note, I always I feel like I'm pulling myself out of the thought pattern to capture it, and then I lose the place that my mind was kind of going. Yeah, and it's almost like thoughts. if you're walking with notebooks, you're walking with the intention of mm-hmm. feeling and thinking things that you can write down, as opposed to just doing it for the sake of feeling and thinking. Mm-hmm. Does that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And it's a it's a great tie-in actually to, um, if you don't mind me transitioning to. Uh, your second book, um, because some of the things you're saying um, uh, about just letting things happen and about being in the moment and and taking things as they are, um, kind of lead into this book, Tao Te Ching, by yeah. Lao Tzu, yeah. um, written in the 6th century BC, I believe the oldest book, I believe, that we've had mentioned on the show so far. A lot of debate, of course, over the authorship and the date uh, about even whether or not Lao Tzu even existed. I, I kind of fell into a rabbit hole on Wikipedia researching about him. I'm like, is this guy even a real guy? Um, but it's, of course, the fundamental text for uh, and basis of Taoism, Confu- Confucianism, and Buddhism. You introduce it on page 179 of A Million Little Pieces as a book from your brother. And you say, the text begins, it consists of a series of short poems numbered 1 through 81. You write out some of the poems in the book, and then you say, I seem to understand what this book, this weird, beautiful, enlightened little book, is saying to me. Live and let live. Do not judge. Take life as it comes and deal with it. Everything will be okay. Yeah. Tell us about your relationship with uh, Tao Ching. I brought a couple different translations here. I couldn't, I think you had a specific one that you I I, liked, I prefer but. the Stephen Mitchell translation. Okay, I don't know um, if I was able to scrounge that one up or not. This one is a it's a brand new one. It's a brand new one. The yeah. Stephen Mitchell translation is this beautiful, simple, for me, very profound book. Um, my brother gave it to me when I was in rehab. Um, you know, I had always been a kid who didn't believe in God, who hated church, who would fight my parents if I had to go to church, who who 
was a punk. Like I said, I was a, a punk kid rebelling against everything. And I found myself in rehab and I found myself confronted with this um, system in rehab of the 12 steps that I just didn't believe in. Uh, in order for the 12 steps to function, you need to have a belief in a higher power or a God. And I just didn't. Yeah. Um, and my brother, one visiting day, probably the uh, second two or three weeks into my time there brought me this book and just said, I thought you might dig this. And he handed it to me and I opened it up and I just started reading it. And it is this really beautiful, simple book about life, about, um, it, it functions on three principles, simplicity, patience, and compassion. So simple in thought and action, patience with yourself and others, compassionate to yourself and others. And if you literally just follow those rules, life is pretty good, pretty easy, pretty a, a lot. You don't overthink things. You don't overfeel. You don't say those rules one more time for us. Um, simple. The, 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 Simplicity, patience, compassion. Simplicity, patience, compassion. Simple in thought and action. Patient with yourself and others. Compassionate with yourself, others, and the world. Beautiful. Right? Yeah. Can't argue with that. Live and let live. Yeah. You know, it, 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 once you've read the Tao and you know how old it is, I don't know if it, if it was the 6th century BC or the 20th century BC. Some people think it's, right. you know. Uh, an amalgamation of a lot of uh, kind of wisdom from people. There's also a whole school of thought that believes it's written by like an 870-year-old man that like had lived right. for all those centuries and wrote it all. Was it Lao I don't mean to laugh at that, but yeah. Was it a guy named the Yellow Emperor? Mm -hmm. who, who was it? Was, and, and, was and, it a group of monks who composed it together? But once you read it and you know how old it is and you read other things, if you read uh, the Christian Bibles or the Koran or so many other, if you read the Stoics, um, they are all incredibly heavily influenced by the Tao. Um, oh, a lot of these underlying principles, you know, love thy neighbor yeah. um, is essentially a Taoist principle. Um, live and let live. Don't judge. I, I again, like Tropic of Cancer, I, I read the Tao and I couldn't believe it existed and it touched me. And I said, this is the first sort of comprehensive philosophical or religious document I have ever read that makes absolute sense to mm -hmm. me. You don't have to believe in God. Um, you don't have to believe in a higher power. You There there are no rules. There, there are... Um, simple ideas about how how to make life easier to live. Yeah, totally. If, if you're fully accepting of everything, right? Yeah, like here's a couple quotes from the book. Um, you call it the Tao. I think I'm totally mispronouncing it by saying the Tao to Ching. So it's duh. You say it with a duh sound. Obviously, I'm wrong. I'm getting that mixed up. I think you can probably pronounce it however you want. Yeah. Like as somebody who believes in it, who cares how you pronounce <laughs> exactly. it? Exactly. Good point. This one, this one is... Um, the, the, the quote that comes up mo most often on, on Goodreads as well. Knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. Mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. Right? Like you can learn a lot from other people, from observing them or talking to them or um, spending time with them. But who you really need to know is yourself, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it's a very simple idea that that if you know yourself, your life is going to be better. And I love that you spelled out. Oh, here's here. I'll give you one more quote. Then I wanted to say something about the translation. It's like when you are. Con here's another quote. When you are content to simply, when you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, everyone will respect you. Yeah, um, there, 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 there is no good in comparing yourself to other people or competing with them. You know, I don't, and, I don't know about be, the everyone will, will respect you part though. That seems I don't debatable. either. <laughs> like I, I, I have a weird thing with. Um, it's not weird. I think it's good with with other writers. I always hope writers do well. I don't care if I like their book or not. I don't care if I'm friends with them or not. I always want them to do well because the more books that are sold. Uh, the better it is for everybody who does it, right? And and I know so many people who compete and compare. 
well, that person has a bigger deal. And in every aspect of life, whether it's within books or yeah. where you live or where mm -hmm. you go to school or what kind of clothes you have or what kind of car you drive, whatever. They're always looking at other people's things and either saying, well, I'm better than that person or I want what that person has. Um, and the Tao taught me that that's a, a foolish waste of time, right? I, I'm, I'm happy with whatever I have and I'm happy with whatever anybody else has. If you write a book next year that sells 25 million copies, <laughs> all I'll do is walk over and give you a hug and uh, say, I, I will happily receive that hug if I, sell, if I write a book that sells 25 million copies. I mean, I know copies. it's a ridiculous, but no. if, if you write a book yeah. that sells, if it hits number one somewhere, I'll yeah. be like, how happy am I for you? Well, I love um, that logic, Jane, because I, 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 like, I, 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 I totally agree with that. But at the same time, don't you find yourself slipping on that? Like, don't you find, um, you mentioned you read the review, right? So you, at some, to some, some niggly part of your brain was curious about an opinion of, on you. Um, and like, you know, I, I have a podcast. The, the, right, you go into the podcast app, the first thing you see is the top 200 podcasts. There's no escaping it. So I'm, I'm shown, and, and it's not just that. We, no, bestseller list. Yeah, bestseller oh. list, everything on social media. Uh, we, we're putting ourselves so public on, on these sort of um, measuring sticks. So let's say the listener right now is agreeing with you, we, and I agree with you. Can you help us a bit more with the how? I, I know that the DAO has helped you. What, how the else more can you, you do the it? More, this is Taoist too. The more you do something, the more you learn how to do it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, I do this. I'm engaged in this sort of exercise with my oldest child right now my ch my child's 13 yeah she has instagram mm -hmm. um, <laughs> of course who does it at 13 and she looks on instagram and sees these photographs of people who are living or are presenting extraordinary things right a trip here of course this shirt tickets at this concert and and she, I don't know if envious, she, she wants some of the things she sees. And I say, Marin, it doesn't matter, right? You, you just need to learn to love and appreciate what you have. It doesn't matter what somebody else has. And it, especially in this world of social media, it's all just nonsense. People are only showing you the absolute best of what they want to show you. They go home at night too and they feel sad. They go home at night too and they feel anxious. We we I always say we we are extraordinarily lucky people. We live in America in the 21st century in a nice safe place with wonderful schools. Like we should just be happy. Whatever anybody else has it doesn't matter. Um Unless they have less than you and you can help them in some way. But I, I literally, I don't, I, I look at those lists at this point in my life. I'll look at, at, I'll be told at some point, well, here, your book is on the bestseller list or not. Um, it's this number. But as I'm out on this book tour, I'm just happy to be doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm 49 years old now is my birthday a couple days ago happy birthday thanks i'm just happy to do it i'm just happy to get to travel around and go to bookstores or theaters or wherever i'm going and meet people who like books and who like my books and it's a great gift it's a great privilege it's a joy it's i don't have to compete anymore i don't i don't want to i just want to when somebody walks up at the end of an event and i'm signing their book i just want them to know I appreciate them. Yeah. And that I'm happy to be there. Yeah. And I can see how uh, I can see the moistness in your eyes as you say that and the beauty that comes from your heart as you say that. Is is any of that uh, um, helped because you had early success? Like, because you had success? Do, do you know what I mean? Like, could someone who has not had um, a, a big pop um, the way uh, um, you have... Would it be harder for them to, to, to learn that that skill? Or do you think it comes from because it's like, I, I did it. And so now I know that the truth and the beauty comes from these really small moments. Maybe, but like, I, I, I it's interesting you use the word early success. Because ah. I, don't, I don't think about it that way. Mm -hmm. Like, I went off to Paris at 21 to be a book writer. Mm -hmm. My first book got published when I was 33. Right. 
So I had 12 years where... Much of it documented in... in uh, I had no yeah. success. Yeah. Nobody gave a fuck. It was just me. Um, I sometimes talk about some of the happiest days of my life or when I was utterly penniless, right? I went to Paris. I moved to London for a short period of time. I came back to America. I went to rehab. When I got out, I moved to Chicago. And I wanted to be a book writer. And I was trying to still working on it. And I got a job in a bar. And there are some bars in Chicago that stay open till four in the morning. So I would work from eight at night to four in the morning. If you've ever worked in a bar, even when it closes, there's another, say, 45 minutes to an hour to clean it and shut it all down. The bar I worked at was in the Loop in downtown Chicago. And I lived about an hour walk away on the north side. And I used to walk home every morning at 4.35 in the morning. And then I would drink some coffee and try to write from about 6.30 to 12.30. And then I would sleep from, say, 1 to 7 at night and get up and do it all, all over again. I had almost no money. I lived in a small, in an apartment, probably smaller than this office. Mm -hmm. We're in an office that's probably like uh, 16 feet by 8 feet. The, yeah. to the total office we're in now. Maybe it was this size. Yeah. It had a bed, it had a mattress on the floor yeah. and a little desk and a bathroom and some clothes piled in another corner. Um, I had no money. Nobody gave a fuck. And I was incredibly happy. I was deeply content. I was deeply content with just working hard and feeling good. And on some level, I hoped and believed there would be a pop but it's not like it happened in a year. No. It took 12 years. Mm -hmm. And and almost it taking that long um, made me appreciate all of it more when it did. And even if it hadn't ever happened, I'd still be doing it, right? I, I write books. I write books because I love the process of writing books. I referred earlier, I'm a solitary person who's most content alone, whether I'm alone in a room or whether I'm alone on a street whether I'm alone on an airplane. I love airplanes now because it's one of the few places in the world where you can escape. You get up on a plane. <laughs> if you choose to. If you choose to. Mm -hmm. You get up in a plane and you don't have cell service. You don't have to sign onto the internet. There's no noise. It's just a, a little vacuum. Mm -hmm. Pod. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's peace. Um, and I love the process of of being alone and writing a book, of staring at an empty screen and knowing that if I sit there long enough and I try hard enough, when I get up to walk away, that screen will be filled with words. Um, it's a deeply joyful and contenting process for me. Beautiful. You had this, there's a lot in there about uh, gratitude and about gratefulness. And one of the quotes I pulled from you uh, that you said was, whatever hardships there have been in my life, I still live in a very privileged position. Fear is not knowing where your next meal is coming from. Fear is seeing a child get hurt. Fear is watching someone you love waste away. Fear is knowing you are going to die yourself. But there's no fear in what I do. I write books. Yeah. I've seen some bad shit in my life, right? And felt some bad shit. And, and, and I've hurt. And you realize that... Um, those things can can fuck you up but but the idea that writing books is hard it's not right i i i i i don't know where that quote is from my um i had a son die right people always ask about oprah oh that must have been so hard i'm like why it wasn't hard i got yelled at by a tv talk show host for an hour big fucking deal i had a son die um, and we were in the hospital and he, he had a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which is a neuromuscular disease where the proteins that carry electrons from your spine out to your nerves stop being produced. So that, so the people who have it generally gradually lose the ability to move and ultimately to breathe. Um, when you see a child die, you're like, this is bad. This is pain. This is not loss. supposed to happen. Um, and even in our own experience of it, when you think about how many children around the world have no food, have no place to live, have no real chance of ever succeeding in life the way we measure success. Um, 
like the idea that writing books is hard. It's a, it's a great privilege. When I do readings, I always begin and end the readings and events that I do by thanking the people who are there. And mm -hmm. I say, I, I am deeply grateful for the gift you give me, which is writing books. I, I get to do it because you spend your money on what I do and, and it means a tremendous amount to me and I want to thank you for it. And it, and it is a gift. It's a place of great privilege. I sit around all day in my thoughts and, and I write them down and people pay me for it. Like that's There's, a fucking easy life. Man. Um, I, I, I so agree. And, um, you know, I, uh, um, this entire thing I, I, I and we get to do is this is, is pure pleasure and we're very, very lucky. Um, you seem to have, gone through so many of the, the bad, bad things you talk about, um, and ended up pretty adjusted. Like you're, you're, you got this deep centeredness to you and, uh, um, I, I truly feel very blessed, yeah. right? I have a wife I love. I have children who are cool. I have great friends. I, I lack nothing. And, and, um, I guess this gets back to the compare and compete stuff too right yeah. i could say i lack things but do i really no i'm very whatever i have is what i what i have uh -huh. and i'm happy with it whether that was yeah almost nothing in a an apartment in chicago however many years ago when i worked in a bar at night or whether it's now when there are more sort of trappings of success if, if you can accept what you have as what you have mm -hmm. and be content with it. Like life's a lot cooler and easier. And I learned all that from the Tao. Yeah. Wow. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Sure. And I appreciate it. Um, you know, there's this quote, uh, not to go back to Henry Miller, but it says, it says, uh, you know, um, you say, people say I, I got yelled at by a talk show for two hours. That was hard. But by the time his books were published in the 1960s and he was becoming increasingly well-known, Miller was no longer interested in his image as an outlaw writer of smut filled books. However, he eventually gave up fighting that image. I thought that was really interesting to read about. It's like, I'm he now moves back to California. His books have been outlawed for years. He's moved on in his life. He's living a totally different life. And then the books get released. Right. And now they're controversial. He's suddenly Henry Miller. Exactly. And he's no longer interested in, in that. Yeah. I think he probably had an interesting relationship with it where he, he, he loved it and he, and it was a, a validation and a gratification of his life's work, but he was also probably old enough where he was like, eh, I just want to see the stars at night. Yeah. I just want to have a nice meal. Yeah. I just want to go for a walk. And sometimes that's not possible when you're so trapped by like people knowing you as. Yeah. I talk sometimes about I'm going to just stop writing books at some point. I did it once, right? Uh, ten, eight years ago or so, I, I stopped writing books. Um, because I said, I'm all done with this. I've, all my dreams have come true. What, do I, what else do I need to do? I'm done with this. I'm tired of being James Fry, right? I, we, I live in Connecticut so that I don't have to be James Fry, so that I can just be a dad on the side of the soccer field. That I can just be a dude walking through the grocery store. Um, and I, so I guess in many ways, I understand Henry Miller of it. Like if you write books of a certain type, people have this image of you that they build up, that they think you are this person. People are often, I think before they meet me, think I'm going to be some sort of snarling, <laughs> aggressive, <laughs> defiant, um, loud, highly competitive guy. And I, I don't think I'm any of those things. I think I'm a pretty mellow, pretty calm, deeply appreciative um, person. Yeah. And, and um, when I go out on tour, sometimes, you know, you, you, people have these ideas of you and, and you don't want to have to live up to them. And especially in America where the media can focus on you so relentlessly. Um, I, I didn't want to be, James Fry anymore. I just want to be like a dude, a dude. Like I said, on the side of the soccer field, it's becoming a bigger play. issue in the world too, because people get this, you know, uh, online, you know, people become scandalized. A book that was mentioned on, on the show chapter eight with Sarah Anderson was, um, 
So you've been publicly shamed. And, and these books about people that just get vilified online. This, this woman on a flight sends a bad tweet out. She, before she lands, she's lost her job. Right. She's the number one trending topic on Twitter. Right. Everyone in the world hates her. And there's someone, as she gets off the plane, taking pictures of her. Right. Before she, you know what I'm saying? And she had like 100 followers. I'm not... Um, I can't re recall the exact details, but I'm like, this stuff's happening all the time. So people are choosing to, uh, you have to escape identities and, and, and kind of, and, you know, and, and just the transparency of the internet. So how, you say, I live in Connecticut to do that. That's interesting. Um, um, I live in the woods in Connecticut. I can't see my neighbors from my house, <laughs> right? I can see the stars at night. I can go for a walk. I can breathe. Um, I, I can go to the little town where I live and nobody gives a shit what I do. Yeah. They don't give a shit that I wrote books that... Uh, they don't care. They don't care. How, how, uh, and I'm happy they don't care. Yeah. I don't want them to care. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so I'm getting the uh, uh, the publicist is walking by the, the glass and waving. So we... Yeah, uh, we, we can we can keep going as long as you oh, I like, like the little defiance. This is good. There's a tiny right. bit. There's a tiny bit of defiance in the gentlemanly. Now, which book? Cause I got, I brought some other books here and these are books that you mentioned to me in, in advance. And I appreciate it. So I, I bought three more. Um, we can focus on, on any one you want to next. We can do them all real quick. Paris spleen. Okay. Baudelaire. Yes. Um, just a really funny, yes. ridiculous book about a guy, again, who just sort of walks around Paris doing dumb shit. You're obsessed with Paris. And it just makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> Can I read a poem from this? <laughs> sure. So, the Paris doggy in the scent bottle or get drunk? I was going to read get drunk. Get drunk's great. So, you know, Paris, Baudelaire, um, uh, this book is published in... 1985 by Vintage? That can't be right. No, it's from the 1850s. Oh, why did I... Okay, I must just have... Um, I gotcha. Okay, 1850s. Uh, meanwhile, the English translation of the French text called Ouvre de Baudelaire, is that right? Um, came out in 1931. Uh, you read it, though. Are you, you going to read Get Drunk? Or? Get oh, that's when I flagged. I'll read, I'll read Get Drunk. Okay. Here we go. Page, what page is that on? The Book of page Poems 74. by Baudelaire about walking around Paris. He's going to read Get Drunk. Get Drunk. One should always be drunk. That's the great thing. The only question. Not to feel the hor horrible burden of time weighing on your shoulders and bowing you to the earth. You should be drunk without respite. Drunk with what? With wine, with poetry, or with virtue. As you please, but get drunk. And if sometimes you should happen to awake on the stairs of a palace, on the green grass of a ditch, in the dreary solitude of your own room, and find that your drunkenness is ebbing or has vanished, Ask the wind and the wave, ask star, bird, or clock, ask everything that flies, everything that moans, everything that flows, everything that signs, everything that speaks, ask them the time, and the wind, the wave, the star, the bird, and the clock will all reply, it is time to get drunk. If you are not to be martyred slaves of time, be perpetually drunk, with wine, with poetry, or with virtue, as you please. Wow. Wow. Fucking awesome, right? Amazing. It's almost 200 years old. And it's really, I feel, I, what I get out of it, well, what, I don't want to jump I mean, on my own thoughts first. Like, what do you get out of that? You know, there's so many variations. The, the yeah. self-help industry is basically <laughs> founded on that idea written by an opium addicted madman in Paris in the 1850s, right? <laughs> and whereas I would say like corny things like carpe diem, live in the moment. Yes. Um, Fine flow. Yeah, our sort of cliches built upon cliches built upon cliches. This was a dude um, who sort of discovered that through misery, right? He was miserable, addicted, fuck up, who was like the only way to get through life and have it be kind of wonderful is to be perpetually drunk. doesn't matter what you're drunk on. Just get fucking drunk, you know, with wine, with virtue, um, with poetry, as you please, get fucking drunk. <laughs> and I just love that's beautiful. That, that's beautiful. That oh yeah, that very simple distilled version of it. Uh, you know, it, he also it's mastered so, the art of the hooky title two hundred years <laughs> before the internet. Yeah, get drunk. <laughs> um, it ties into a lot of the stuff we were talking about before to Baudelaire, to the Tao, to open your door and step outside, yeah, and take whatever life brings to you and and love it fucking love it and now i sound like a corny self-help guy cliche on cliche on cliche but that i believe that open your door and step outside and whatever happens to you fall in fucking love with it 
Um, it's a beautiful way to live. And I can't say I'm perfect at it, but I do can say that I try, right? I got here yesterday um, and I had a bunch of media like I do today. And then I had an hour and a half of free time and I opened my door and I just walked around, you know? I just walked around Toronto and looked at people and went into places and it, it wasn't particularly exciting at all, but it was better than sitting in the room and returning emails or checking social media or seeing what, you know, the latest Trump bullshit is. Like, go out and, and, and live and get drunk. Open your door, step outside, whatever you do, make sure you fucking love it and go out and just live. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, James. Thank you very, very much. Hey, everybody. It is just Neil again. Thank you so much to James Fry for opening up his heart and giving us what was inside. As James says, it's easy to follow rules. It's a lot harder and a lot more fun to say, fuck all of that and find your own way to do what you feel inside, to do what you think is right, and to do what's true to your soul. A couple more quotes I picked out from this great conversation with James. Reading books is like traveling. It opens your mind to worlds you would never know existed. I love this one. If a thought is worthy enough, it'll come back to me. And if it isn't, it isn't. It's a growth for me personally. And he he went there, you know. He he I didn't want to like I didn't want to kind of push and pry on the Oprah thing. I mean, I figure if there's any person who's talked about any topic enough, it would be James Fry talking about Oprah. But he let us go through a little bit. And I thought it was really insightful because as artists or as people in the world trying to put something out there, you know, there's this fear of backlash, of getting slapped, of getting kind of publicly humiliated. And he says, you know what? People say the Oprah stuff must have been terrible, right? But he says, I got yelled at by a TV talk show host for an hour. Big deal. And he shared the tragic story of losing a son and how the perspective he gained from that helps things like being yelled at by Oprah kind of wash away. Uh, thank you so much to James Fry for giving us three more books on our top 1,000, including number 930, Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller, number 929, The Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, maybe Tao Te Ching, maybe Tao Te Ching, how do you say that word? Um, and number 928, Paris Spleen by Charles Baudelaire which James did an excellent reading of a great poem, Get Drunk. We are going to put a link to Get Drunk in the show notes because that is just a fantastic poem. But the true meaning of being intoxicated uh, 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 with the world and with life. Finally, uh, just a huge, huge shout out also to Simon and Schuster who gave us the time and the space to conduct this interview. Uh, I'm so, so, uh, I'm like, I'm like, hi, I'm drunk on these conversations. I am drunk on this podcast. I am drunk on three books, winning Apple's Apple Awards, getting ranked super highly. I'm drunk on the fact that I get to talk to James Fry. And next chapter, I get to talk to Angie Thomas, author of The Hate You Give and On the Come Up. This is a huge, huge, huge pleasure for me. And the fact that we are doing this all without ads, without sponsors, without interruptions means that it is my gift to you and you are my gift to me and we're having so much fun together. So if you are resonating, if you are are jiving with this, give me a call at one eight three three read a lot. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you like. Let me know what you don't like. If you feel to trash me, give me feedback. I want feedback. I want to get better. We got three hundred and thirty three chapters and we're only in our, in the twenties, right? So we got. <laughs> I got over 300 chapters left to improve. I hope I get better. I'm sure I will cringe at listening to my voice 10 years from now. But anyway, give me feedback. one eight three three. read a lot And thank you finally so much for listening. And now, if you made it to this far in the podcast, I'd like to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. Yes, this is one of two clubs we have for three books listeners. This one is, of course, just listen to the end of the podcast. And the other one is the secret club. 
The club you can only get the code word, the password to if you call our number, you do a few things. I will only hint that that is a 100% analog club, okay? It's nowhere online. It is entirely through the mail. So how do we start off the end of the podcast club? Well, we always go to the phones. one eight three three 833 read a lot is our phone number. So let's go there right now. Hi, Neil. This is Carrie calling from Wilmington, Delaware. And I want to say awesome job on the podcast. I'm so excited that you launched it. And I've been wondering, why haven't I listened to this sooner? Um, some of the episodes I've really enjoyed are with uh, Gretchen Rubin, also with Seth Godin and Mitch Album. And I, I really, or Album, excuse me. And um, what I think is especially great about these is how they connect with each other. I haven't listened to the episode with the Uber driver yet, but I can't wait to listen to it, especially after Seth Godin. Also, I had no idea how impacted Seth has been by what you could call motivational speakers. That was really interesting. Also, a thing that I think is great, Neil, is that you are having no book shame, and you even called Seth out on that. And yes, yeah, so the people who start reading books because of Fifty Shades of Grey or Daniel Steele or whatever it may be, so what? Um, so I think you're doing a really great job. I'm so excited to have called this number, and now I'm going to go check out that special password and be a part of the Cool Kids Club here at Three Books. Thanks, Neil. Thank you so much to Carrie from Delaware. Interesting what you say about the thread line. You know, you mentioned Gretchen, Seth Godin, Mitch Album. Uh, you had no idea how impacted Seth was by motivational speakers. And true, true enough about No Book of Shame, yet yeah, no one's picked Fifty Shades of Grey yet. But I will tell you that I think we're about to have our first comic book come on to the show. And I can't wait till someone picks Fifty Shades of Grey finally or or – you know, a trashy kind of uh, novel that they read when they were a kid, whatever, you know, um, that's that's what the show is all about. So thank you so much to Carrie for calling in. And now let's move on to our letter. Like I said, a letter can always be a review plucked from an online channel like iTunes or YouTube or Stitcher or whatever. It could also be an email that I got. It could be something that was tweeted. It could be something that was mailed to us. Uh, our, our mailing address is on the website. And in this case, it was an email, and it came from Samantha. And Samantha says, Neil, on an episode, you mentioned that you plan to have a couple of people give four books so that you could get 1,000 from your 333 guests because your wife gave you one during your first episode. But I thought that she gave the one so that the other 333 guests would therefore give you three for 999 books total. So the one she gave you would get to 1,000 books. Every episode since you mentioned that, I have been wanting to send an email to share that observation. Loving the podcast, Samantha. You know what, Samantha? Uh, yeah, I think, well, the thing about counting to a thousand books is you're right. We could have done it that way. I was always thinking of it like the 333 chapters would be three books each. Okay. So that adds up to 999 books total. What about the final one book? Well, I have some ideas percolating uh, that will be in development for, you know, 10 plus, 12 plus, 13 plus years <laughs> till we get there. But I was thinking like, because Leslie gave me one book in chapter one, right? Uh, Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. So I'm thinking if I want the 30, 333 chapters to then equal 999, I need two guests along the way to give me an additional book. I've already asked one guest to do that. I probably won't air that show uh, until the fall. Um, but but I'm, I'm hinting at that because uh, this was a person that really inspired me and really inspired the show. So I was like, hey, can you give me a fourth book? And, and he kindly said yes. And I don't know who the other person is going to be. Sometime over the next 10 years, we got to get a fourth book from somebody. And I also am I'm kind of watching out for the fact that maybe someone will only give me two. Somebody's going to say to me, like Judy Bloom kind of said that to me. She's like, I don't know if I have three. So if I get that, then we got to kind of make it even out. Thank you so much for the question. And I hope that gives you a good response. But I'm still working. The other thing, by the way, I should mention, Samantha, is that I'm having to reject books now because, like, Tim Urban picked The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, right? And I actually recorded that one um, before I recorded Chip Wilson, the founder and former CEO of Lululemon. And Chip Wilson was like, hey, can I pick The Fountainhead? 
by Ayn Rand. And I was like, oh, sorry, someone already picked that. And he's like, oh, bummer. Well, how about Catch-22 by Joseph Heller or whatever? It's fine. But then more recently, someone else just asked to pick The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. And I had to say, no, you can't pick The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. I want the top 1,000 to be a list of 1,000 formative books. So I don't want The Fountainhead or any book to be on there like a dozen times. Okay. So that is an interesting kind of little problem I'm having now. I'm only like not even a year into it here and I'm already having to reject Ayn Rand like a -a whack-a-mole over and over again. What other books are going to be requested uh, over and over? And and how do I say no to somebody, you know, and that's going to be hard. So that's just another thing that's in the back of my head that you didn't ask about. Okay. And now it's time for the word. Let's Let's finish up with the word of the podcast. And for that, let's go back to James. I didn't go to a fancy school. I don't go to literary festivals. I don't play that game. Um, and I don't write books that sort of fit easily into the, the sort of current canon. Yes, indeed, it is canon. Not to be confused with canon. Because there's a spelling that's C-A-N-O-N, and it sounds exactly the same as C-A-N-N-O-N. Canon, 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 canon. Of course, C-A-N-N-O-N is the thing that shoots a cannonball, right? Boom, that's a cannon. But the cannon James is talking about is different, right? It's different. Let's see if I can pull up the definition right now. Here's the dictionary lady saying it. Come on. Cannon. Cannon. A regulation or dogma decreed by a church council or an authoritative list of books accepted as holy scripture. Or the authentic works of a writer, as in the Chaucer canon, or a sanctioned or accepted group or body of related works. This is it, right? A canon, accepted group of works, the sort of body of writing, the sort of the big body of writing. But the interesting thing is the origin here. Um, I just went on a big rant about how canon, C-A-N-O-N, is different than canon, C-A-N-N-O-N, but it turns out the origin is kind of tied together in a strange way. See, C-A-N-N-O-N came from 1400, a tube for projectiles derived from the Greek kana, K-A-N-N-A, meaning reed, since both are hollow tubes. A cannon is a hollow tube and a reed is a hollow tube. But cannon, C-A-N-O-N, may have also derived from the Greek kana, C-A-N-N-A, meaning straight lines, straight rules, kind of the ultimate, the ultimate, right? So they both came from the word reed, but they meant different things. And the interesting takeaway here is that cannoli, like the Italian dessert, or cannelloni, like the Italian tubular pasta, and cannon, the thing that you shoot a cannonball out of, are all the same idea of small tubes, right? And that straight edge of a small tube may have actually inspired the word cannon, C-A-N-O-N, that James was referring to, and which is a different definition. Why do I mention all that? Because next time you eat a cannoli or some cannelloni, you can kind of tell somebody at your table, like, hey, did you know that this was derived from C-A-N, like a reed, the same way that cannon was? Okay, are you as nerdy as me? Or is that, like, is that, that to me is like an interesting bit of trivia. Anyway, that is what we do with the word of, of the chapter. We get right into the origin of some weird or interesting word. And now it's time to say goodbye <laughs> to another chapter of three books. I am loving this. This is super, super fun for me. I hope you guys are enjoying this journey as much as I am. Huge thanks to James Fry. Huge thanks to Simon Schuster for putting this show together. And until next time, let's all remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning that page and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. <laughs>